every six months, I drive against the AI. So we go to a track and I drive the robo race car and then I jump out and then they put ballast in and then the car try to beat my lap time only with AI. And the time is getting closer and closer. So it is already much faster than a bronze driver or a silver driver by, I would say, one or two seconds, already faster. So it's probably faster than 99.999% of the world's population. But at one point, it will be faster than every human at any condition in every way. Professional sport is big business. It's a world where individuals can earn as much as a decent sized business, and teams have evolved to become multinational corporations. And where there's money, well, technology follows, especially when there can only be one winner. And often victory only lasts a year. So it'll come as no surprise to anyone that sports is very much a high tech endeavor. The days of jumpers for goalposts are long, long gone. But what is surprising is the way in which sports teams are encompassing the cutting edge of data to improve not only human performance, but also fan enjoyment. Behind every televised sporting event are vast teams of academics, data scientists, and artificial intelligence behaviorists working on algorithms which will revolutionize human activity, both at the highest elite level and for us, well, more everyday folks. In this episode, we'll be meeting with just a few of these amazing people to look at how data has become a key part of sports and looking at what organisations around the world can learn from them. You're listening to Technology Untangled, a show which looks at the rapid evolution of technology and unravels the way it's changing our world. I'm your host, Michael Bird. The sporting world has changed dramatically in the last decade or so. From revolutions in material technology, better sportswear, shoes and balls, we've recently seen an ever-increasing focus on the athlete themselves. In fact, there's been a bit of a backlash against so-called technical doping, which is where equipment gives the athlete an uncompetitive edge over others who don't have the same access to the best kit. Most recently, a certain running shoe was banned from competitive races because it gave athletes who used it a huge edge. It was quite simply too good to be used by professionals, which presumably didn't hurt itself among amateur runners one bit. Instead, we're seeing a move from technology which amplifies the human to an emphasis on technology to aid them. The focus has become on fine-tuning training, nutrition, health and support to the nth degree in the hopes of wringing every last thousandth of a second out of an athlete. And that's great because thousandth of seconds are how competitions get won. So how do we get to this point? And what's next? Professor Steve Hake OBE is a sports scientist at Sheffield Hallam University. He's led research which has resulted in hundreds of Olympic medals. He's been employed by some of the largest sports manufacturers in the world to improve their equipment. And he's been named as one of the most influential scientists in Britain. And he also chairs the research board for the global weekly running event called Parkrun. So if you want a list of credentials for improving sporting performance, well, it doesn't really get much better than that. Steve has lived through and led the revolution in sports data from the very moment it began. I can almost pinpoint it, 2006, June 2006, when uh, the iPhone came out. And the iPhone came out and suddenly we had coaches going, I've got this iPhone, can we do something with it? Can we collect some stuff with this iPhone? And can we have video? And can we... Did it? And then suddenly we went from being people who made stuff and tested how they might fly through the air to can we collect data to prove that these things actually work out there in the field? And that's where we've ended up. So that's kind of how it's changed, really. It's gone from trying to make things to improve performance or coming up with interventions to improve performance to can we prove 
that this thing actually worked when it was put in place in the actual field, literally the playing field. So, in a sense, it's similar to the idea of agile and iterative development in IT. The advent of mobile and wearable technology allowed coaches and scientists to model and test theories in the field with immediate results. It was a revolution. Just like in organisations, a strategy or tweak could be analysed using qualified data to see exactly what effect it would have in the real world. So... If the current revolution is in data being used to improve athletic performance on the pitch or on the track, could the next one be in data augmenting athletics? Matt Armstrong Barnes is a chief technologist at Hewlett Packard Enterprise. He specializes in artificial intelligence and the ways in which it can be used to help us. Unsurprisingly, that's an area which has huge implications for sports performance. So if we look at chess, back in the 1990s, Gary Kasparov played the first game of Centaur Chess, which was man and machine beats both machine and man. So we've seen that the combination of technology and a human being does provide a better overall capability than each individual entity on its own. In any sport that has a significant technology element, we're getting a lot closer to that, where the human being is augmented by technology. Is the next evolution of that to be a human being is augmented by AI-based technology? So in, in motorsports, for example, racing drivers are bombarded with enormous amounts of information audio information, anyone who's looked at the steering wheels can see the volume of data that's coming out of that, the decisions that they have to make. Could you put an algorithmic decision-making capability that's going to filter out all of that information and only present the driver with things that are highly relevant to the situation they're in? A couple of impacts of that. Would it be safer? I mean, if you look at the size of the steering wheels, how on earth these drivers, it just goes to show their level of professionalism and high, enormously high level of skill that they have. The readouts are really small. They've got tiny little steering wheels with really small buttons on it and really small information to read. And they're listening to their pit crews and all of the other dialogue that's coming in. So if you have an AI that is looking for all of that and can alert the driver to potentially dangerous situations... Is AI going to be a way of adding safety into the sport? So I think there's quite a lot of things that we need to consider when we start to think about how it could be added into any sport that is inherently using technology. So now would be the point in the show that it would be great if we could talk to an elite racing driver about their experience of using data on the fly and whether AI could help them. Especially if we could find a racing driver with a passion for technology, a pedigree in building and racing autonomous cars, and a deep understanding of how technology can merge athlete and machine in perfect unison. Well, I'm Lucas Igrassi. I was born in Brazil. I'm a professional race driver. I've done Formula 3, Formula 2, Formula 1, Formula E, won a couple of championships, a couple of races. And uh, today, I still race in Formula E for a Rocket uh, Venturi Racing. The team is currently leading the championship as we speak. In my free time, I've been part of technology companies and um, creating racing series and racing cars uh, of my whole life. For example, Robo Race, which was our first autonomous race car. Now we are launching a, a world championship of e-scooters uh, with scooters that can reach 150 kilometers per hour. Lucas has a passion for all things tech and understands when it comes to sport, particularly motorsport, data and technology are pretty crucial elements. Both in Formula One and Formula E, you cannot send data to the car during a race. So basically, you cannot change the software of the car from the garage to the car. So you cannot send instructions to the car as the race goes by. So everything has to be either pre-programmed or self-adapting because as soon as the car leaves the garage, you cannot change any setting. That's done on purpose. That's why we have so many buttons. If we didn't have, if this two-way system would work or it, it would be legal, probably the steering would have two buttons, max. <laughs> Pit lane, speed limiter and something else, a radio and drink maybe. 
because everything else is a pre-selected system that the driver needs to adapt because there is a lot of things we have to do apart from driving. You're basically playing on like a, a Game Boy effectively whilst you're trying to go around these corners it sounds like in between the corners actually but yes <laughs> do you think that if you had the opportunity to like rewrite some of the rules you would make it so there was computers making more of the decisions if i could rewrite some of this stuff i would keep the development of the rules and the software very relevant to commercial vehicles and to the let's say commercial products so maybe ai is a good example how do we create an ai that help with the car setup or something like this but also keeping the driver very relevant so if something would help a lot the driver to drive that for sure has to be contained or forbidden keeping the relevancy and keeping the development the technology development pace moving forward is very important and that's basically software today and while keeping the driver as a centerpiece because racing is a sport, is a human sport. Today, a combination of AI and human is the fastest way forward in many ways because the humans are very good at uh, creativity, at, let's say, intuition and behavior of other drivers, so overtakes and stuff like this. But uh, driving already is it's becoming obsolete and it's just a matter of time. But it's not just sports teams. Using AI to improve outcomes has huge value potential for organisations too, which is why so much money is being put into creating AIs which can play games and learn to beat human players. Basically, if you can teach an AI to get better at a game, you can teach it to get better at quite a lot of other things, which are very important to organisations like pattern prediction and competitive strategy. Now, according to Matt Armstrong Barnes, HP have jumped on this themselves and have already had success in creating an AI which can do something incredibly difficult. Predicting and beating a human competitor with unknown variables, using emotional strategy and psychology. And that's much, much harder. But it's also got a ridiculous amount of potential value in unpredictable real-world cases both in sport and in business. We built an AI that played Texas Hold'em. It was a collaboration with an American university. It's more complicated than chess because there are unknown quantities that the AI doesn't know about. So it doesn't know about the cards that aren't in its hand or the cards that are in the deck. And actually, we found that human beings beat the AI we queried the human beings, the, you know, the professional poker players, and said, after we lost quite a lot of money to them, we asked, uh, why are we losing? And they said, you can't bluff. So we taught the AI to bluff, and the AI, the AI went away and actually won back more than we'd lost to these professional poker players in the first place. I think we lost $700,000 first time round. We went back and won a million dollars back, I think. So I think there's quite a lot to evolving these models. And what we're seeing is... That it comes back to GANs, which are artificial intelligence networks that play off against each other. So it plays tens of millions of games without actually having to play a game because they're all played digitally. And that's one of the constraints that we're starting to see with human beings is there's a limited number of games that we can play. If you can digitise them and play them in a digital space, then the AIs can be much more effective. EA Sports actually used the algorithm that is underpins the EA Sports football games and has successfully predicted World Cup winners. So when we start to look at it from the analytics around, just from a gaming perspective, they're quite advanced in using those analytics to allow them to be effectively understand how teams operate, how individual players operate, and how effective they're going to be in performing with other players from different teams to play at a national level, which is quite a different set of statistics than we normally see. So AI could potentially create a sandbox in which millions of outcomes can be modelled and then apply to beat or help human athletes and sports teams. The ability to use computing power to analyse, repeat, predict and process data is something which sports scientists like Steve Hake and his team are looking at very closely. 
After all, building models which can suggest improvements, spot trends, and apply them to training programs is a proven route to success. I started out in golf, despite not being a golfer and having no knowledge really of golf. And I, and I started off looking at the impact of golf balls on, on golf turf. That was my PhD. And after three years of research, I think I ended up with something like a thousand golf ball impacts on turf. Okay, now my students can do 10 times as many of those and they can automate all the processing, etc. Now, when it comes down to things like impacts or running or some kind of repeatable event, once you get up to a certain number, you're more or less sure what the answer is. So you don't need that many bits of data. And so what you find is you find you have two worlds. You have a world where you've got one event and you collect as much data as you need, or you've got lots of individuals and you have one piece of information about all those individuals. And that's where you get these huge kind of data banks. So when you look at elite athletes, we'd like to think we've got big data with our elite athletes. So the team here at Sheffield Hallam University creates data acquisition systems for UK sport and for all the different teams. And what they'll do is they will collect lots of bits of information. So for instance, it might be swimmers. They might collect a lot of videos on swimmers and they'll have stroke rates, stroke frequency, information on the starts, etc. And you get a lot of information about individuals but you don't actually have all that many individuals in, in population terms. You know, you've got a team and you might have 10, 20 athletes, depending on the sport. And then you might compare to other countries. And so you've got a handful of countries and you've got a handful of athletes for those other countries. So you might get up to hundreds, if you're lucky, of other athletes. And you might have lots of data about very few individuals. And so the problem you end up with is you end up having lots of case studies rather than trends, if you're not careful. So from an elite sport point of view, it can be quite tricky, but there are ways around that. And what you're looking for is trends over time. Are you getting to the stage where you might get a gold medal, that kind of thing? What Steve is talking about is really interesting. Modeling patterns accurately is a key part of creating a viable program for improving performance, or developing a competitive AI. And when I spoke to Matt Armstrong Barnes, he mentioned something pretty similar. There's been quite a lot of activities around monitoring golfers and golf swings and using sensors to work out what optimum golf swings is. When they're stood on a professional golf tee, it's still the golfer who's hitting the ball, but off when he's practicing, he's had some guidance. They've modeled him, they've built digital twins to work out how the optimum swing can happen. And they've instructed the golfer, shift your weight, do that, change this very slightly. Of which, if again, if you're a professional athlete, you can take those very small tweaks to what you're doing with some science in it that are ultimately going to allow you to hit the ball farther. So I think there are a number of cases where AI is capable of analysing vast amounts of telemetric information and work out optimum pathways through that, which can then be fed into athletes who can then apply that into the game where they're not providing the guidance. They just get it as part of the way they're practicing or changing the swings or changing how they move around the pitch. Or when you start looking at team tactics, why don't we try this formation? Or why don't we try this attack pattern? Or there are different ways that AI can help analyze all of that information and provide an extra pair of eyes that's fact driven. But again, you need the people with the experience who can look at all of those data points and work out which is the best. So by creating accurate modeling data, we can analyze information much faster and extract information much more quickly to spot trends and improve performance as Steve's team are doing or we can develop game-changing or winning AI analysis models, such as Matt talked about. But how do you collect that data? Steve Hake sums up one option pretty well. You just record athletes doing their thing. We've ended up in this world where we now have 
wearables and we've got data, but video is brilliant. And usually if you can see it, you can measure it. And no company is driving that more than Hawkeye Innovations. You've probably heard the name before. They're synonymous with virtual refereeing and goal line technology, particularly in tennis and cricket and football. Their system enables real-time capturing and processing of extraordinary quantities of data, helping referees make decisions in seconds, as well as providing a performance boost for athletes. My name's Peter Irwin. I'm Global Commercial Director for Hawkeye Innovations. I've been with Hawkeye now for about 13 years. I imagine many people will be familiar with Hawkeye, but can you just explain what Hawkeye Innovations does? So we're historically a sports technology company. So we've been around now for about 20 years. So first started in, in tennis and cricket, and people will probably know us for the sort of officiating services we do in those sports. Lang calling is the ball in or out in tennis. LBW decisions in, in cricket have all been using our technology for a lot of years now. About 12 years ago, we made the step to move into football. And at that stage, it was very much you know, goal line technology. That was the big issue, particularly after the World Cup in, in 2010 and, and Lampard's ghost goal against Germany. I think the best testament you could sort of give it is a lot of people don't know it's being used because it's all happening behind the scenes and it's automatic and the referee gets a signal to its watch very quickly. So we split the sort of systems up into tracking technologies and, and video replay. The tracking technology, they're all optical tracking systems. So there's nothing going on the players or anything like that. It's a very unobtrusive system. So we, we have cameras that are located in all the stadiums, whether that be tennis stadiums, cricket stadiums, football stadiums, um, depending on what technology it is. And they are basically using vision processing. They're all synchronized and using vision processing to detect, whether it be the ball, whether it be the players' joints, etc. So it's all camera-based. And we've got a, a huge team of software developers that are significantly smarter than me that are doing all the, the algorithms and, and things like that for us to be able to track and provide that data in, at such a low latency. Most recently, we've moved into the data space. We're actually producing quite a lot of data during the match anyway, um, which is a byproduct of having to be there for officiating services. So we've actually developed a, a skeletal tracking system. So we're tracking currently 18 points on all players bodies in real time so this isn't happening after the match this is all happening so you're building a skeletal model of every player and, and the officials as well and obviously that has a quite a few applications in a lot of various industries as well if you're creating skeletal models of all the players real time you could probably do some quite interesting computer generated replays where you can put cameras in places that you wouldn't be able to put cameras in before is that the idea yeah, that's one of the, the big applications. So if you look at from an officiating standpoint, you, you've seen a lot of stuff in the press recently about automatic offside, and that's basically having offside decisions being used based on data, and it's based on our tracking data. So obviously that's the officials getting a benefit from it. Then you've got the teams, the players themselves are getting access to enhanced data that, that wasn't existed, you know. Yeah, yeah. There must be some really cool things that they can do. Like, I suppose if they have this data about how they're performing, you must be able to say, well, you're you know, not performing quite as well. You're not running quite as fast. Or maybe there's an injury in your leg because you're, I don't know, there's like a subtle limp or something. I don't know. Yeah, exactly. And, and it sort of it comes into two parts. There's the tactical aspect of it and, and what this data can do from a, a tactical point of view. But then there is the sort of athlete performance, fatigue, injury prevention side as well. We're not only capturing the speeds that they're running at in real time and, and things like that, but because we're, we're tracking the skeleton, it's, you know, stride length and sort of movement analysis will be extremely important. And, you know, potentially being able to establish is a player, you know, has a stride length change, which means, he, you know, he might get injured in the next five, ten minutes and, and things like that. Much like with Steve's research and video tracking of performance, Hawkeye's technology allows them to extract intimate detail about the performance of athletes in real time. It's truly remarkable what can be done with smart people and a lot of video cameras. The second way of collecting data is to get it at the source, not with a camera pointing at the objects, but from within the object itself, be that in the form of wearable tech, sensors and balls, or any other smart equipment. And nowhere is that clearer or more important than in motorsport, where literally thousands of data points are being collected every single second. 
Here's Lucas Degrassi. Data has become the most important asset in any form of company. You don't need to be a technology company or a race team. You can be a soccer, a football team. You can be a baseball team. And in Formula E, it's even more important because a lot of the car is controlled by software. When you're driving, your car is collecting millions and millions of bits of information, probably every second, every minute. Over the race, probably tons and tons of bits of information. Why does it capture all that information? How does it help you as a driver to drive faster, be more competitive, that sort of thing? So the way the motor deploys, how you regenerate or brake in a wet surface or or different grip levels, or if you're riding a curb, how you deploy your energy during a race in terms of strategy. Do you deploy more energy at the beginning of the race to try to gain some positions, or do you save energy and you deploy in the end? All of this is controlled by the software, and the software is updating itself as the car drives with this data. So if the data is corrupt or if the data is not good enough, the car will give you the wrong or the or not the optimized information. So you have a component of live data that changes the car, and you have the component of the non-live data, which is basically the data recorded with thousands of sensors that will be transferred to the computer, to the engineers' computers later on, and then we analyze a suspension movement, we will analyze tire temperatures, steering angle, brake pressure front, throttle positioning, using all this uh, information to try to optimize your driving style, your energy deployment and the car setup. So that data is being used to inform the driver and the team about performance and driving conditions. But how can data be trimmed and isolated to thin out the noise and to actually develop performance improvements? What we haven't talked about in this brave new world is how to pick and choose your data. And it's a really important part of the equation. Ensuring high quality information is filtered and passed on to the right people is one of the biggest challenges facing not only sports teams, athletes and researchers, but frankly anyone who uses large amounts of data, which, well, that's pretty much every organisation. For Hawkeye Innovations, it's a key part of their business. First off, it's a logistical challenge, given the colossal amount of information they produce in, say, the average football match. But it's also a huge opportunity to do more with what they are collecting, and a key part of their business. You know, we're tracking all 22 players, the three officials in soccer, the ball as well as being tracked in football. We're, we're basically capturing these images 50 times a second. So basically all that data has been being produced 50 times every second. So yeah, you can imagine the sheer amount over 90, 95 minutes of a football match of what, what we're producing from a tracking perspective and every joint's having to do a 3D coordinate. So at the moment that's 18 points in a player's body, that's actually increasing to 29, um, I think actually next month. So it's a colossal amount of data and then that's before you even aggregate it and actually produce the insights that this data is driving. So there's not only sort of the raw data that can have huge applications as well, it's the actual aggregated compound statistics that you can, and insights that you can drive off it. It's a lot of work going on behind the scenes. Very true. Can you talk through the ways that Hawkeye is presented to, I guess, like the different categories of, let's call them customers, because I suppose you have like people watching the match, you have the people who are officiating the match and the people who are playing in the match, in the game. Yeah, so... And I think it's a very important point about how you visualize the same data set may be different depending on who the end, end user is. You know, coaches or managers want all the data. Players want then, they need to decipher that down. And the players want the important data that's going to make a difference. Because if you give, I think, players too much data, a lot of it gets lost. They need the, the fine points that will help them either win a match or help the team win a match. I think from a, a fan point of view, it's, it's really important because we're also here to educate the fans on what's happened, what they're watching. So it's very easy to see that visually, right, you think something's happening tactically in a match that you're watching. But actually, when you delve down in the data, there's the nuances of right, what they're trying to achieve, on, whether it be on court or on the pitch. So the kind of tactics that Nadal employs against Federer is very different to what he employs against Djokovic. And you might not understand that or see that when just watching the broadcast footage. Whereas actually, if you can you know, gain access to all this data and how we visualize it is extremely important because you want to educate fans, but equally you want to be able to communicate the story in a really accessible way and a way that they can immediately go, oh, yeah, actually, that's brilliant. 
So it's something that we've had to fine tune over the years uh, because we do offer products for all the different stakeholders. We do have a number of different products and tools for that visualize the same data set. Don't get me wrong, it's the same data that's underpinning it. But yeah, it's really important that you visualize it in the most appropriate way for people to actually understand it. Getting the right data to the right people, it's something that all organizations are going to have to think about as we start to collect more and more information and try to get the best insights out of it. Creating user experiences where the relevant information is shared to those who need it without all the noise of a million other bits of data is really important to getting the best out of our data and delivering value. And that's key because it's widely believed in business circles that our data is soon going to be a line on the company's balance books, just as important as sales. It's definitely something that HP's Matt Armstrong Barnes is pretty enthusiastic about. Data visualization is an enormously important to make sure that you're representing it in the right way that doesn't obscure the data or obscure the findings, but can be looked at through different lenses because data will mean different things to different sets of stakeholders. We see it as a common problem across just business analytics, across all disciplines, is finding a way that means that you don't have to completely recut your data to present it through to different audiences. And what we can find is that if you take too much of that approach, you decant the data and you start to lose the value of the data because it's not derived from its original source. So applying visualization on what it's going to look like so that different stakeholders can kind of cut the data in a different way, but they're all looking at the same data. That's definitely a critical way of demonstrating the value of AI into an organization. But Matt's also keen to stress that it's possible to have too much data. So much, in fact, that you can actually dilute the insights, even if you have produced and prepared it to suit the needs of the people who need it. Ironically, you can get to a point where the more data you have, well, the less it can tell you. There is this concept of highly complex, highly dimensional feature spaces actually have the lowest amount of value unless you reduce the feature space, in which case you increase the value of the data. So that's all about saying, how do I take all of these telemetric points and work out which ones are going to add me value? As I reduce the dimensionality of my problem space and apply that, I get smaller models. And it's easier for me to tune them, to tune what's known as the hyperparameters which are on the models. And that results in higher levels of accuracy. So it seems like the key is to simplify what you're looking at from the start. Take racing cars. They collect hundreds, if not thousands of pieces of information every second. Some of that is useful. Much of it isn't. Picking out the best information from the sensors you have available and then feeding that back into the model is a key part of making the car fast and competitive. And the same theory applies outside of the sporting world, in creating autonomous cars, for example. If you imagine if you're building an autonomous driving vehicle, you will focus on certain aspects of the model that you're constructing because you'll want to make it better. A common one would be turning left. So with your fleet of cars that you have as test vehicles and potentially people who have your cars on real roads, what you can do is you can instruct all of those cars to say, whenever anyone turns left, turn on hyper monitoring, gather everything that you possibly can, because that is what we're looking to improve in the model development as the way of we're refining it. So the cars generate all of that data, all of that data comes off the cars and moves through a number of staging areas. Additional processing can be performed and then it can move to its final destination, which might be where your data science teams are working on, where they're not working on all of the data because that's too big of a problem. Things have already filtered it out, so they're only getting to the data that they're really interested in that is going to add value. So they're being proactive in saying, this is what I need in order to refine the work that I'm doing. That does require planning, it requires execution, it requires an understanding of which of the feature sets of your models that you're working on and which of the overriding use cases you're executing when you're building your models. 
What that does mean is that there is a, a knock-on impact of the processing power that is required at the edge where the sensor is because it needs to have a greater understanding of how to execute gathering more data around turning left. However, because we're seeing the, the compute capability getting smaller and more available, the capability to perform that is greatly enhanced. It's fascinating stuff, but let's bring it back to sport because there are, in fact, efforts to bring AI and automation onto the racetrack. Building an autonomous vehicle for the road and one for the racetrack are two quite different things, though. It's one thing to optimise a tool and have it operate safely at a consumer level, but how close are we to having elite-level AI race cars? And this is where it gets interesting because among our guests, we have a slight difference of opinion. In Matt's mind, well, it's some way off before the human is out of the equation. So we've got quite a long way to go before we have AIs capable of operating intellectually as the, at the same level as a human being. Apply that in a sporting context, sporting is a physical activity. So as a result, you need the physical side of it. So you then get that blurring between what is AI versus what is robotics. So if you want to put an AI-powered race car round a track, how much of that is AI versus how much of that is engineering a car that is going to go really fast? Because you could say, I'm going to build an absolutely fantastic AI-based race driver and I'm going to put it in, a, in my reasonably priced car. It's not going to beat a Formula One driver in a Formula One car. But for Lucas de Grassi, it's a rapidly approaching possibility. And it's one he's actively experimenting with. I do this challenge with RoboRace. Very few people know, but I don't even know if I can say this, but anyway, I will say it. We are creating this um, documentary with RoboRace that for the past many years, every six months, I drive against the AI. So we go to a track and I drive the RoboRace car and then I jump out and then they put ballast in and then the car tried to beat my lap time only with AI. And the time is getting closer and closer. It is already much faster than a bronze driver or a silver driver by, I would say, one or two seconds, already faster. So it's probably faster than 99.999% of the world's population. But at one point, it will be faster than every human at any condition in every way. So we're already in a place where data and machine learning are helping athletes to optimise their performance, getting close to a situation where AI can actually start competing against humans, if that's something we want to do. But that's a moral dilemma for another episode. At the very least, sport is helping drive a trend where technology and computer power is being used to amplify the human and enable them to operate at their best the so-called centaur effect. And it's happening across the board, from sports performance research to injury prevention, virtual refereeing to AI-driven decision-making and fine-tuning race cars on the fly. The key is that at every stage, people are being augmented by relevant insights drawn from an enormous pool of raw data. Steve Hake is right. We're no longer in a world where sports technology is about bouncier rubber or better racket strings. We're in a world where elite performance is driven by data. Just enough of it in the right place at the right time. And that's something that we can all learn from in our own organisations. You've been listening to Technology Untangled. I'm your host, Michael Bird, and a huge thanks to Matt Armstrong Barnes, Lucas Degrassi, Peter Irwin, and Professor Steve Hake for speaking to us. Incidentally, Steve has written a book if you're interested in the history and future of sporting technology. It's called Advantage Play Technologies That Change Sporting History, and you can find it wherever you get your ebooks. You can find more information on today's episode in the show notes and be sure to hit subscribe on your podcasting app of choice so you don't miss out when our next episode lands and to catch up on the last two series. Today's episode was written and produced by Sam Datter and me, Michael Bird. Sound design and editing was by Alex Bennett with production support from Harry Morton and Sophie Cutler. Technology Untangled is a Lower Street production for Hewlett-Packard Enterprise. Enterprise.